Well, hey guys, thanks for checking out Next Level Carpentry. In this video, I want to show you the elegant system I came up with for creating some pretty amazing faux beams. And it's a system that I've developed over the past few months because I've got a project where I need to build about uh, 130 lineal feet of faux beams for a new house. It's kind of the modern rustic style. And so I wanted to use real wood for the beams, not the foam ones. Uh, they're, that's a pretty amazing solution for some situations. But for this project, it needed to be real wood so that I could match the grain and texture to existing millwork in the house. And I'm not going to tell you that this is an everyday DIY project because it does require some pretty precise uh, millwork and joinery, but it is very doable with even a modest level of skills and tools. And I say that because in the past I've done other faux beam videos where I was making shorter sections of beams and I used specialized clamps to get that done. But because of the volume and length of the beams that I'm working on for this project, I had to develop a system that got away from using a whole bunch of specialized clamps. And the elegant part of it is that it basically involves some special glue blocks and the lowly pocket screws to make this happen with little more than what you see here on the bench. But I'm not going to start out at the beginning with the rough boards because that's rather routine carpentry and millwork to get the boards to this stage. But I will show you the steps that I used to do the final milling on these boards, uh, and create these various blocks and pieces that you see here. And I'll start off by showing you how I ripped and dadoed these long pieces. After flattening, thickness planing, and straightening rough sawn 1 by 12 pecky cypress boards into pieces 3 quarters of an inch thick and 10 and a half inches wide, I ripped a 26 degree angle on one edge for the 612 ceiling pitch and a 45 and a half degree angle on the other edge for the long mitered corners on the bottom of the beam. Notice that I use my exclusive Grote Tangent Ramp Roller Stands to rip long wide boards like these by myself with ease. After ripping those bevels, I orient and stack the beam face boards to stage them for plowing dados next. Using a Forest Dado King blade set to exactly 3 quarters of an inch wide and 3 16 of an inch deep, I adjust the rip fence so the top of the dado is 7 and 7 8 inches from the miter's long point on the bottom of the beam. After plowing the first dado, I check it for location, width, and depth. Then, with everything set up, I plow dados in all the beam side pieces using the same setup at the same time for consistency. Having accurate dados running full length in each beam side piece is key to success with this extreme faux beam design. Once I've gone through those gears to make these long pieces, I take a side step to make these special clamping and gluing blocks. So I'll show you the steps that I used to make these because they need to be very accurate and consistent, but accuracy and consistency isn't too tough to get for making a stack of these blocks. I'm using half inch thick HDF material for these blocks. For these particular beams, I start by ripping strips 7 and an eighth inches wide. Next, I cut pieces 7 and 1 16 inches long from those strips. This size varies with each project, but the sequence and features are the same. Once I have plenty of blocks for this beam, plus a few spares, I stack them on their sides, in this case the 7 and 1 8 inch edges, align them with the rip fence, and clamp the stack of blocks together. With the blade set to 3 16 of an inch high, and the rip fence set to exactly 3 quarters of an inch, it takes just seconds to gang cut a notch in both sides of all the blocks, safely and accurately. When all the blocks are notched, I changed the setup by raising the blade, very high for this next cut, and setting the fence at 3 16 of an inch to the far side of the blade. Using this setup and a good measure of caution, I'm able to trim both sides of these glue blocks, leaving a 3 quarter inch by 3 16 inch lug on both sides of the top edge of each block. I confirm the fit of the glue blocks on the back of a beam face by drawing a square layout line across the face and slipping a block snugly into place. With the lug pressed into the dado, you can see that there's a small space between the bottom of the block and the beam's bottom, which is another key feature of this design. The next step is to drill holes for six pocket screws in each of the glue blocks. With my Craig jig clamped in a vise, I position blocks on their edges, hooking the lugs on the jig's edge for location, and drill two pocket holes in each edge of one face of the blocks. I simply use the bottom of the block aligned to the other side of the jig to locate the other two holes on the same face. Then I flip to the block's other face and align the block sides with the jig sides to drill two more holes in the bottom edge of the block. 
screws in these holes will hold the bottom of the beam firmly during the final glue up. Although all six holes are strategically placed, the beauty of this design is that precise location isn't really necessary. All the steps that you've seen up to this point are ones that are required to use this system for beams up to the length of the lumber you can get. For instance, if you need a 12 foot beam, you get 12 foot lumber. This is everything you need. For the current project I'm working on, a couple of the beams are 30 feet long, so I've got to do some additional things that involves uh, splicing some boards with splice blocks like this that I made. But that gets a little more involved, even though the same steps and components are involved. So to kind of keep this simple and give an overview, I'm going to pause here and just do a dry fit up of a 12 foot section of beam so you can see how all this stuff comes together. And then later in the video, I'll show you some things that I've kind of learned as I've gone through the process of making these extra long beams. And the amazing thing is, like I've been saying, this job, I'm making 30 foot beams, but if my shop was a little bit bigger or the job required it, I feel comfortable that this method and this process uh, could be used to make beams that are 50 feet long. It's just a little more logistics involved, but the design and the procedure that I'm going to show you here on this single length beam are scalable to some pretty amazing stuff. Should you find yourself in that sort of situation where you need real wood and if the design requires for a full length beam rather than shorter pieces hidden by faux straps to cover the seams. And that's kind of the, the driving factor in developing this system because the designer and the client didn't want three 10 foot beam sections with a couple straps in the ceiling of their great room. They wanted it to look like one solid beam the entire length. And methods and tools that I've used previously just aren't scalable to a beam of that length. But as you're going to see, this system is. I apologize for the parts of this that are redundant, but I just want to give you a quick overview of the parts I've made to this point so you can see how they come together for the assembly process. And basically, in a nutshell, I've got two beam sides, a left and a right. Each of the sides has a 45 and a half degree miter on one side or bevel on one side. Uh, in this situation, because it's going up to a, the ceiling of a 612 pitch, I've got a 612 bevel cut on the top of the beam so it fits up tight to the ceiling. And then I've got a dado plowed the full length of each of these faces. This dado is exactly 3 eighths, 3 quarters of an inch wide and 3 sixteenths of an inch deep. It's important that the dado is spaced precisely the same distance from the short point of this miter or this bevel to the location of the dado. As you saw when I was fabricating the blocks, there needs to be a little bit of space under the block at the bottom of the beam. And speaking of bottom of the beam, that's this piece here. It's trying to fall off my table saw here. Uh, but this is simply uh, a one by basically a one by eight with that 45 and a half degree bevel on each side. Uh, but it's important that the width of this piece is very accurate and very precise. It probably didn't show up in any of the videos, but rather than have this um, bevel come to a sharp point, you can see that there's a slight flat spot instead of a razor thin point, which helps handling these pieces because I'm not dealing with a razor, razor thin edge on the full length of all these pieces. It makes it a little bit harder to work with and a little more difficult to get a consistent width in the pieces because that sharp edge can crumble. But, and I can get away with that in this design because ultimately the corners get hand hewn and rounded. So I leave them that way because as you know, you got to make it easy on yourself because nobody else is going to. And I guess it goes without saying that all these pieces need to be very flat and very straight. If they have a hook or a bow in them, it complicates the joinery. The grooves and the bevels aren't parallel to the edges. They're inconsistent. That doesn't work. And they also have to be very flat. They can't have ripples in them and any twist in any of the pieces would carry through and end up resulting in a twisted beam. So that's kind of the overview beyond DIY carpentry stuff I talked about because before I started shooting video for this, I took these boards from uh, a rough inch thick with all kinds of issues, got them all clean, flat, straight and true before I proceeded with the joinery. But if you're into making beams of this scale or this level, then the capability of getting true and flat boards is within your wheelhouse. So with that overview, I'm going to do a little bit of layout and show you how this comes together. 
I'll do a couple things to assist in the layout for these blocks. Uh, and the first one is just to put a clamp on the end here to keep things lined up and keep the ends lined up. And the other thing is I've got a, just a piece of scrap here that's exactly three quarters of an inch thick. I'm just going to drop it down in the dado on one of these pieces. That's just kind of a press fit. And then I'll use that so that I can square lines across for these blocks. Now, uh, a neat thing about this method is that the spacing between the blocks is pretty arbitrary. Because of splices I've made on longer beams, I've you know, been as close as 16 and as far as 24 inches apart. So it, it doesn't really matter as long as there's enough in there uh, for good pressure when the beam's being glued up. But for the sake of this segment, I'm just going to um, We'll start at six inches from the end and then go two feet or 18 inches on center, more or less. And that gives me pretty even, pretty consistent spacing. If you had troublesome boards and you really wanted it to pull up tight, you could, you know, you could put them 16 inches apart. If you got something that's really cooperative, uh, two feet's plenty. But where the distance between the blocks isn't all that important. The fact that they're perpendicular to the edges of the board and they line up perfectly across from board to board, that is important because it affects how the beam comes together. So here you can see why that little board is helpful because I can use it and a framing square to quickly draw layout lines for each of the blocks along the length of this 12 foot beam. And those layout lines serve as a guide for screwing the blocks into place using inch and a quarter pocket screws. As you'd expect, during final assembly, I used Type Bond 3 wood glue all along the edge of this to make sure these blocks are held securely in place and to add strength to the final assembly. But because this is just a dry fit, I'm just using the pocket screws to demonstrate this. The lug on the block fits snugly in that dado and helps to locate the blocks precisely up and down. And then as long as I follow that layout pencil mark, everything is going to be square and true. Once I've screwed the last of the blocks to one face of the beam, I'm able to flip it over. and line up the blocks from the first face onto the alignment marks on the inside of the second face and screw them into place. I make sure to align the block with the pencil marks from the layout step and then slip the lug into the dado for perfect alignment. And then because of space constraints, I switch to an angle drill to drive the pocket screws to attach the blocks to the other face of the beam. And then I continue on down the beam lining up the lugs in the dado and the blocks on the lines, and then finish screwing the blocks to join the beam faces firmly together and perfectly parallel to each other. And this end block is a good example of how slick this system works, because once the lug drops into the dado and I line up with the pencil mark, I know that the assembly is perfect. As I approach the end of the beam, I want to make sure that the beam is flat. As I go along, because this method makes for a very strong beam, but if the beam is curved when the screws are driven, it's going to stay curved, especially if the beam is glued. But that's not too tough to achieve. And I'll be able to finish the rest of the screws and the rest of the blocks to complete this part of the dry fit assembly. Well, I hope you can take my word for it that it doesn't take long to put 16 screws in the blocks to attach these two faces to each other. And once that's done, you can see what this assembly looks like. And it's got a little spring to it here, but the edges are perfectly parallel because of the spacing of the blocks and those dados. And I can just flip the thing upside down here. And you can see that already this beam is just absolutely as stiff as can be. There's no flex in it this way. So it's ready for the next step, which is to put the bottom in place. And even though this is just an elaborate dry fit, you can see what this setup looks like. Uh, these pieces are held parallel to each other by the blocks. 
that are screwed and eventually glued in. There's two uh, matching bevels or facing bevels there and then the bottom piece has matching bevels to that. And the next step in the assembly is just pretty straightforward. If this were a final glue up I'd take my tight bond glue and put heavy beads of glue along these surfaces, kind of brush it out to make it even. And then fitting the beam is merely a matter of taking the bottom panel, sending it on top, and dropping it into place just like that. And you can see in this handheld shot how the corners fit together. Keep in mind that I make these miters at 45 and a half degrees so that the outside points fit nice and tight when they're glued and held in place with screws. And there's a little quirk joint in the corner because I didn't cut the pieces to a razor sharp bevel. And looking inside the beam you can see the last feature of the blocks in their design in that there's just a little bit of space between the bottom panel of the beam and the bottom edge of the blocks. And that allows the screws to draw that piece tight into place when they're driven. So that the miters are drawn up tight before the bottom of the beam contacts the bottom of the block. Just like now, in an actual glue up situation, I need to hold this piece in place while I roll the beam over so I can drive those screws. I'll just throw a couple of clamps on here to keep it in place and keep it from making a, a big gluey mess if things would come apart. But all I need to do is flip this thing over like so. And you know, keep in mind this beam, this is 12 feet long. It would be just as easy if this was 16 feet long, uh, even though the sides are a little over 10 inches tall and the bottom is 8 inches wide. It's all very manageable with one person in a small shop. And by using a bit extension and a magnetic tip, I can just slip this down inside the beam and drive screws into those pocket holes in the bottom of the glue blocks. Just like that. And driving those screws applies pressure to the mitered glue joints there so that no clamps are necessary at this stage of the build. Kind of sweet. And ironically, at this stage of the build, the trickiest part for me isn't assembling the beam, but positioning the camera in such a manner that I can drive the screws and you can see what I'm doing. But as a rule, I start with blocks near the center of the beam and work my way towards the ends. And I'm also careful to equalize the screw pressure and not drive the screw on one side too much before driving the other screw. And that keeps the bottom centered up between the sides. And sometimes it's a good idea to skip a block or two while screwing the bottom in to make sure the bottom stays centered up between the sides. Because if it starts to go off a little bit from one block to the next it's hard to straighten it back out and you could build a bow into the beam. So to help avoid that I just skip a block now and then to make sure everything's lined up and all the while I'm using my fingers on the outside corners to shift the beam bottom back and forth to make sure it stays centered up because that's important for keeping the beam straight as the screws are driven and the glue drives. And you can see the process in action as I drive screws at the other end of the beam where you can see the mitered corners shift around as I make those adjustments and drive the screws. And I know I'm doing a good job when everything is tight around the block and the space between the bottom of the beam and the bottom of the block is a nice even gap. And with that, uh, the dry fit is complete and other than a bit of mess, this is really no different than it goes on the final glue up. At this stage, of course, I'd go and clean up uh, runny glue from inside and outside the beam just to neaten things up. But for the most part, that's a done deal. From this angle on the end, you can see that that beam is arrow straight from one end to the other and not a single clamp is required. And not only is the beam straight and true, it's square to its corners because those blocks inside are what set the squareness of the beam so there's no twist in it. And not only is the beam straight and true, but even though this is just dry fit with screws, no glue, this is just rigid, stiff as can be, and stays straight like that. And even though this beam is 10 inches tall, 8 inches wide, 
and 12 feet long. This old nail bender can pick it up and take it to the job site. But it's not ready to go out to the job site yet because I've got a lot of work to do on this, splicing these pieces and making this beam 30 feet long. But let me give you a close-up shot of these miters for any doubters in the audience. The miters are nice and tight on the ends and they're drawn up snug and clean all the way along the length of the beam. And keep in mind, this is done with a handful of pocket screws and not a single clamp. So you can see that the design is scalable to beams that are much larger and much longer than this without busting a bid budget, purchasing a bunch of clamps to get the job done. So for anyone that's able to buy boards long enough to do the beams in a single piece, this is pretty much the end of the road. If I only needed a 12 foot beam for this project, I would just let the glue dry long enough so that working on it didn't stress any of the glue joints a few hours, possibly overnight, and then I'd go about the finishing process to make the beam look like this. And for anyone interested in doing an aged rustic finish like this, I've done a number of videos showing the steps that I use to get to that point, and I'll put a link over here so you can check that out if that's the direction you're headed. But this process works just the same if this was going to be a beam made of solid cherry with a stained and varnished finish. It's pretty much the same steps to get to this stage. But as it is, I've got to disassemble this and get into the splicing work to make the beam longer. And I'll fire up the camera again when I've got something to show you about that process. Oh, but before I tear this beam down to work on those splices, there's one more thing I wanted to show you about this design. And that is how the design of the blocks and the configuration of the beam allow for a good deal of flexibility in the method for attaching the beams to the ceiling. And the key part of that design is that the tops of these blocks is recessed down below the top edges of the beam. And that allows me to make blocks or strips that are attached to the ceiling that in turn hold the beam to the ceiling. In this case, this is going into a cathedral ceiling with a 612 pitch, so I've made blocks with a 612 pitch cut into them and I can just screw through the bottom of the blocks up into the roof trusses with lag screws with enough strength to hold that in position forever and always. And then when the beam's installed, the beam will just slip over the ends of these blocks and then it can be attached with trim screws coming up at an angle through the faces of the beam into those blocks to hold everything forever and always. And that will give a nice tight fit to the sheetrock on the ceiling in the room. Pretty much like that. And in a situation where the ceiling is just flat, these could be just square blocks that serve the same purpose. Those are screwed to joists or cords in the trusses, or else a long strip that's the width of this space can be screwed to the ceiling, the beam slipped over it, and then the screws driven in to the sides or ends of those blocks to hold the beam in place so that you never have to worry about it crashing down on the sofa or the dining room table. Another benefit of this empty hollow feature here is that if there's wiring for accent lighting or a ceiling fan that hangs from the beam, etc., it can just weave through this empty space in the beam. So there's some flexibility in the design depending on the installation there too. As you can see, it's another day because there's another t-shirt and I got to get to work tearing this beam apart and working on splices. But I want to stop for a minute to ask you to consider subscribing to Next Level Carpentry if you haven't already so that you can be the first to be notified when new videos like this show up on YouTube. And while you're at it, if you like this kind of video with original in-depth content, go ahead and hit the thumbs up button so that YouTube knows there's stuff going on here at Next Level Carpentry. And speaking of t-shirts, ones like this are available through links in the video description where you can purchase these things on spring along with various plans and posters, etc from the Next Level Carpentry channel. So check that out if there's something you see and something you want. There's also links in the video description to my favorite suppliers where purchases through links there provide a little bit of support from the channel through ad fees, etc., for posting the links. And those are there for you if you need one of those items and you can't find it locally. And before I get back to work, I want to give a big shout out to patrons of Next Level Carpentry who help support the channel through patronage at Patreon. There's a growing list of patrons there who support the channel with monetary donations, but as patrons, they also have access to a growing library of in-depth video content 
from here at the Next Level Carpentry Shop and out on various job sites from time to time. Recent videos in that patron-only library show some interesting in-depth stuff about these beams that goes beyond what I'm showing here in this video. And I hear comments from those patrons that tell me that they find great value in those patron-only videos. So if that's something you're motivated for and interested in, check out the link to Patreon in the video description, and I'll quit yattering and get back to it. Now I'll tackle the challenge of creating any beams longer than the lumber you can buy. And that challenge is to make a convincing board that's as long as the beam that you're going to make, which in this case is 30 feet long. So to do that, I've got these three pieces of pecky cypress that are prepared like I showed earlier in the video, and they're still about 12 feet long. So I've got almost 36 lineal feet of material. So I've got a little flexibility of exactly where I cut the splices because I can trim off almost six feet of waste to get a nice grain match. And to make that bottom board as convincing as possible, I've laid out these pieces ahead of time and picked which end looks best next to which end. I've kind of labeled them here and I've decided that these two ends should blend together quite nicely with a properly cut miter joint. So I'll bring you in close to show you that process, which is basically the same as I'll use on all the other joints on the bottom and faces of this 30-foot beam. And I've got this crazy long work surface set up here. It starts with a bench on that end, carries over the table saw, and ends up down here with one of my groat roller stands, which serve to create a fairly flat surface to work on while I'm cutting and fitting this joint. The camera is looking at this upside down, but you can see I've labeled these two ends A. That end of the beam will be at the front of the great room. So this is the first joint that shows up. And I've got these grain patterns here with a knot and this grain pattern. Uh, and these are separate boards, obviously, probably from different trees. But I found these features on these ends of these two boards that should blend together nicely. If I cut the miter where these pencil lines are, and you can see how this grain pattern here should flow nicely into that one. So that's my goal, is to cut here and here to make this fit together. And I'll make the cuts at 45 degrees to maximize the gluing surface. And I'll cut the long point on this side and the short point on this side because the main viewing angle in the great room is this direction. So you'll be looking past the joint instead of into the joint. And I use the same overview and thought process to locate and cut each of the splices in each of these pieces. You can certainly use more sophisticated methods than I'll use here for cutting these miters. But I'll show you that this can be done pretty quickly and pretty simply with basic tools. I've just got my little Makita saw here where I can drop the angle to 45 degrees, make sure the blade depth is where it needs to be, and then use a steady hand and a large speed square to cut that 45 degree bevel on the end of the board, somewhere in the neighborhood of my pencil mark. And because I find it easier to cut bevels like this with the long point facing up, I transfer the mark on the other board to the back side of the piece and cut the miter from that face. And then reorient the boards to check the fit of the miter. And I think you'll agree that that is a pretty sweet matchup considering the randomness of the boards that I'm working with. Once I'm satisfied with the grain matchup, I take a razor sharp block plane to clean up the cuts made with that little saw. And it doesn't take long to get a perfect fit that will be strong and disappear after glue up. Once I've got the bevels plane perfectly smooth, I reorient the boards and check the fit of the miter again before I glue up, this time using a four foot level as a straight edge to make sure the miter cuts are perfectly perpendicular to the edges of the boards so that the joint fits when the boards are perfectly straight in alignment. And this test shows me that the fit needs a little bit of adjustment because one side of the joint overlaps. So I'll make a little adjustment using that sharp block plane to perfect the fit. And the path to a perfect fit like this might be a bit shorter if you've got a top of the line sliding compound miter saw. But I thought you might enjoy a little insight into the old school way joints like this were fit on job sites back in the day. And I'll say now, as I said back then, I'll buy that. Once I'm satisfied with the fit on the front, I flip both pieces and attach them with a splice block. 
I'm using this half inch Russian birch for splice blocks because it's thin, it's stiff, and it's strong, and it doesn't add too much bulk to the beam. I make the splice block about a quarter inch narrower than the board on the back between the short points of the miter, and then you can see I've drawn kind of reference marks here to center the block up on the board, and I put a center mark here that'll line up with the miter on the back of the boards. And once I do that, I'm using a little carbide tip snappy bit to pre-drill and countersink hole that attaches the splice block first to the board with the miter short point facing up. Then I drive some one inch Torx drive screws through the block and into the board to hold it in place. As I said, I attach the splice block to the board with the short point of the miter facing up on the back side, and that helps fit the miter because the board with the long point can be jammed up underneath the splice block for a nice tight fit. With the two boards in place, I double check the alignment mark and use the four foot level to make sure the board edge is perfectly straight and everything looks copacetic at this point. When I go to glue this joint together for good, I want to make sure I can get pressure on this board against this board before I drive the screws. So I just screw down a temporary clamping block here by piloting for screws as before and then attaching the block with those same torque drive screws. Once that block is secure, I use a 36 inch long squeeze clamp on the clamping block and splice block and put a little bit of pressure on it to tighten up that moiter joint on the face of the boards. And you can see the effect of the pressure here as it forces the long point of the miter into the notch underneath the splice block. With pressure applied, I use the four foot level one more time to make sure the edge is straight and do a little bit of tapping to align the bevels on each side of the bottom boards. And this step in the process highlights the importance of good consistent milling to make sure that these bottom boards are the exact same width so that there's not a step in the board at the joint. Once everything's in place and I'm satisfied with the fit, I drill and drive screws into the opposite end of the splice block to hold the joint firmly in place. And once the splice block is screwed firmly in place, I can flip the board over and inspect the fruits of my labor. And with a little bit of glue and some clamping pressure, that joint is going to be excellent on the bottom face of this beam. And that right there is how I go about creating a 24 foot long one by eight for the bottom of the beam. And all I need to do to make this 30 feet long is to do another splice on the other end to get a good grain match up on the joint and then trim the ends to the 30 foot overall length that I need for the beam when it's done. And I don't know about you, but I've yet to see 28 foot long one by eights available in any big box store or lumber yard in my part of the country. Oh yeah, and keep in mind that this board is Pecky Cypress which makes it more valuable and rarer still, and helps justify the time and effort it takes to make boards like this for beams like these. After going through all the gears again, I've now created a one by eight piece of Pecky Cypress that's 30 feet long, and it handles pretty much like a single board because of those splice blocks on the back. This isn't glued up yet. I've got to do all the test fitting and everything, for the whole beam, get all the splices done, and then I'll glue those all at the same time. But I think that that's kind of an unusual piece of wood right there. And as I said earlier, this process would work with beams, uh, you know, 50 feet long, 48 feet long, if you had three 16 footers and enough area to work. I think with another pair of hands, it would be manageable to make a beam like this in that 50 foot range, which is kind of cool if you ask me. But I'm going to keep going on the splices, work on the splices for the beam faces, get all that set up, and I'll come back to the camera when I glue up one of these joints, just so you can see what that looks like. Well, you can see that it's still burgundy shirt day here in the shop while I'm working on these beams. I spent a couple hours uh, cutting and fitting all the faces and the bottom of the beam and finished fitting and dialing in all eight of the face splices. Uh, there's two in the bottom and three in each side. And I've already glued up five of the eight joints, but I wanted you to see what this process looks like as I'm making these 30 foot long one by tens of Pecky Cypress. And because there's a fair amount of stress on the face while I'm working with it until it's assembled into the beam, which is pretty structurally rigid, I want to make sure these joints are really strong. And so I've come up with something that I call a hybrid glue joint. And it involves using Titemon 3 glue and JB Weld 
on the same joint. And I'll bring the camera into the middle joint of the back face of the beam to show you what I'm talking about. And this is what the back of the joint looks like after I cut and fit the face pieces here. And to get this hybrid joint, what I do is use epoxy on the miter and then use type on three for the splice block. And because I've got to leave all these pieces stacked up as that JB weld cures, which takes, you know, a good eight to 10 hours in a 72 degree shop, I flip the piece over first and use a piece of thick, sturdy, clear packing tape on the face of the beam so that any glue squeeze out doesn't glue this face to the one drying underneath it. So that piece of tape will catch any glue squeeze out as I go through this glue up process. For this project, I'm using the JB Weld steel reinforced epoxy and I can get away with that because the weathered finish on the beams is gray itself. So any glue joint on the face side isn't going to show through the gray stain. If I was using a regular stain finish, I would probably switch to a clear epoxy for this project. But I know this stuff is super strong. And so as long as I can get away with the color, I'm going to. But to JB Weld, for anybody that's used it, is simple. Just squeeze out a good sized pile there and use a putty knife to mix it to an even gray consistency. You'll see that I'm using this plexiglass mixing paddle. Works nice. I've had this thing for decades actually. So it's super handy for this kind of work. And I'm using a sharp putty knife to get thorough mixing quite quickly because it doesn't leave any of the unmixed epoxy stuck to the board because it's straight and sharp and mixes everything that I dispensed. Doesn't take long at all to mix it up. And on previous beams, I used an epoxy called PC7. It's uh, in some ways it's stronger than JB Weld in my opinion, but it's pretty thick. And this JB Weld isn't much thicker than uh, the tight bond glue. It doesn't run like tight bond would on this joint, but it also squeezes out when I put pressure on the joint. And I'm just putting it, you know, plenty of it on here. I don't care if it squeezes out the other side. I want to make sure the joint is full. And I got that tape there to kind of catch everything. And once I've got that smeared on one side of the joint, I'll switch the angle of the camera so you can see this a little bit better. But I've got a generous coat layer of that JB Weld steel reinforced epoxy on there. I'm just going to kind of press this in so that the two faces meet. They meet face to face. I like uh, the coverage I'm getting on this side of the joint. You can't see this too good, but I just want to make sure it's all covered, which it's doing real nicely. And this JB Weld is going to penetrate into the end grain and make a nice strong connection on these two mitered faces. And that's looking pretty hunky dory. I'll clean up a little bit of that squeeze out on this side just because I can. But the next step is to put one of these splice blocks on. This is about six inches wide, 20 inches long. I'm just going to center it up here on the middle. This is where it'll get screwed down. And I've already pre-fit all of this stuff when I did the joint just to make sure everything fit good. And I numbered everything so I know everything's going to go where I want it. And I can just glue this up, put some strips of glue in here. And this just makes sure that I get a very good positive connection between that splice block and the face boards themselves. And the splice block adds a lot of strength, but the one kind of strength that would really have trouble handling is if uh, this board got flipped over and bent. If this, if this joint here is under tension because the board bends, it's got a likelihood of breaking. And I don't want that. So even though I'm using all this glue and these screws, I do have to be careful handling the board even after the glue is cured. And I'm using these little one inch Torx drive screws to hold the splice block down. And I make sure to drive the screws down good so that, so that I get glue squeeze out on there and I know this block is tight to the face of that board. Because ultimately it's the strength of the block on the face of the board that adds the strength to this joint. I can check the fit of things right here. Make sure that the board is in alignment. I don't want it to have a kink in it like this when everything's glued up. 
so I get it closely aligned there and then I take this clamp like I used in the setup process and I use this to apply pressure to the joint so this comes together and you can see the glue squeeze out there you should be able to got a little bit of epoxy to clean up everything's feeling good but I'll go down and uh, eyeball this to make sure that there's not a kink in this connection there was just a slight kink in there and you can see this glue squeezed out when I straightened it out but you can also see how this clamp is forcing this long point of this piece up into the short point of the other piece under this block so that's an extra strong joint because epoxy actually has gap filling properties but the less of a gap it has to fill the stronger the joints gonna be and that's what that joint needs to look like I'll clean this glue squeeze up in a little bit but another thing I'm doing on these beams because the faces are so wide and I can't glue over this dado I'm putting a little temporary piece on the top of the beam here that will help hold everything in alignment as the epoxy sets but then I'll remove the block uh, for the final installation of the beam because there'll probably be a a bracket screwed to the roof truss somewhere in here so this one doesn't get glued down it just gets screwed in place for strength as the epoxy cures overnight and once everything is screwed into place I can take off the clamp and remove this little clamping block here because it would just be in the way later during beam assembly and you can see in this panning shot that this beam face is arrow straight and judging by the glue squeeze out under the clamping block and in the miter I know that this is going to be a super strong joint once the epoxy and tight bond 3 cure and because the beam is 30 feet long and the shop is 30 feet 6 inches long every time I set up the camera and move into the shot I've got to duck under my 30 foot long workbench but I'm going to finish out burgundy shirt day by gluing up the last two joints in this face of the beam everything sets up overnight and I'll come back tomorrow with a clean shirt and a new outlook on life and shoot a little video as I assemble this 30 foot long faux beam now that these hybrid glue joints have had a chance to set up uh, overnight it's been almost 24 hours I can show you something that I'm pretty much guessing you've never seen before and what it is is a 1 by 10 by 30 foot piece of pecky cypress you can see how this pretty much acts as a solid piece because of those glue joints and splice blocks on there and now that the glue is set up I can flip these pieces over and do a little bit of work on the joints to remove that epoxy and I'll show you what that's like to get an idea of what you can expect from this process if you uh, ever happen to be doing a similar project and what you're looking at here is the face side of one of the hybrid glue joints and I can just peel off this clear uh, packing tape that I used to protect um, surfaces from getting glued together with that JB weld but it's set up nice and solid and all I need to do to dress these up is just use an 80 grit belt on a belt sander kind of remove the epoxy and do any leveling that's required where the two pieces of wood come together and that's pretty much all it takes to clean the excess glue off that joint and remember these beams get a, a dark gray faux finish so the little bit of epoxy that shows there isn't a problem if this beam was going to get stained and lacquered I could have used clear epoxy and that seam would hide quite nicely as well and I'll do another joint down here just so you can see the process again and realize that this is repeatable and scalable for making uber long boards for making uber long faux beams and it takes a bit longer to belt sand away the excess epoxy on this joint because there's some unevenness in the boards from previous wood stabilization efforts that you can see here where the epoxy shows from this wood and that epoxy was used to kind of give some structural integrity to this whole section of the board in an effort to preserve length on the board and the character of the grain on this pecky cypress and now after that bit of belt sanding you can see what a 30 foot long 1 by 10 looks like when the seams are cleaned up and it gets even better later on when I do the texture to blend the peckiness from one board to the other at those seams
Now that all that splicing work is done, I can go about building the beam using the steps that I did before. And you can see these little wings here. I just screwed some scraps to my 2x12 workbench. That bench is 24 feet long, and now it's 30 inches wide. And I can just tip my boards over onto those extensions. I'm putting the bottom of the beam over here. That's the 1x8. And I've got these pieces of beam oriented so that it'll just all assemble the way it is. I don't have to pick these up and flip anything end for end. But I can flip this 30 foot 1 by 10 over onto the ears on this side of that work surface. And I already got everything lined up and they laid out for the assembly blocks already so that I can proceed with gluing those and screwing them into place to put the two sides of the beam together like I did previously with that single 12 foot section. Once everything is laid out and set up, I just distribute glue blocks along the 30 foot length of the beam. And then starting at one end, I glue and screw them into place on those layout marks. On a technical note, I modified two of the blocks by shortening them a half inch on the bottom so that they don't interfere with the splice blocks on the bottom panel when I assemble the beam. And I'm able to make quick work of installing these blocks as I did before on the dry fit once I've got the system down so it doesn't take long to get them all glued and screwed into place. You hear me use the term scalable a lot on this beam build and I hope it's clear to see that doing the actual glue up on this 30 foot beam doesn't require a whole lot more effort than it took to do the dry fit on that 12 foot beam earlier in the video. As expected it didn't take a crazy amount of time to put all the blocks on one face of the beam so that now I can flip this over and screw it together like I did before on the other one with a couple of changes because I'm here working alone. I don't want this glue to get smeared all over the place. So I've clamped some blocks, uh, four of them along the length of the beam. I'm just temporarily clamping those here. And I've got everything set up so I can put the glue on this face down here, tip this over, and then I'll be driving the screws down. So uh, that's what the setup looks like. Uh, this is the biggest, longest beam I've done this way to date. And so uh, I'm just going to get into it here and uh, wish me luck. So far, I'm into about a half a bottle of that tight bond glue for this project. And uh, I think kind of maybe those folks at tight bond ought to be patting me on the back or something, don't you? <laughs> Using their glue on a job like this. All right, now it is time to flip him over here. Here we go. So far, so good. Let's drop this guy down and see where we get. I guess there's a few shortcomings to building a 30 foot beam in a shop that's 36 feet or 30 feet 6 inches long, but it can be done. In my estimation, this uh, part of the assembly is very scalable as well. Just these few temporary blocks in here allow me to work on this long beam all by myself. And I'm not sweating any of the uh, layout or anything. I'm just going by the marks, driving screws where the block goes. The little lug holds it in the dado, so everything is uh, self-aligning, basically. And it just works out very nice. And I can pull this last uh, spacer block here so the whole beam can kind of drop where it drop down in where it belongs. I've got that nice snug fit of those lugs down in that, that long dado so it, it brings everything into alignment as I go through the process. And I didn't really plan to show so much of this assembly, but I don't want anybody saying, oh yeah, I brought in the extra helpers as soon as the camera was shut off. But now this is all me by my lonesome. Chimps, Chip's not here today. I think he had a little too much Thanksgiving and he's not working these days. 
Getting that second side glued up and screwed into place was actually much less trouble than I anticipated. And after only about 10 minutes, I've got both sides of the beams glued and screwed together. And I'll reiterate that the surface I have for assembling this beam is pretty flat over its 30 feet of length. So that I'm not building a bow into the beam with all these screws and glue. So now with these 30 foot sides all assembled and glued up, I'm ready for the last nerve wracking step, which is going to be to glue the bottom into place. And in this case, because the beam is so long and I've got to drive the screws in, I'm going to have to flip the beam this way onto the bottom once everything's glued up rather than drop the, uh, the bottom in upside down, clamp it and flip it over. I think that's just too much of a deal. So my next challenge is to figure out how to do 60 feet of glue joints on here quick enough that the glue doesn't skin over or just run off and to leave plenty on the surfaces so that the joints are full when I flip this beam over. So once again, wish me luck. Well, I'm not really sure what kind of video I'm going to get of this process. What I've decided that is that I'm going to glue up both surfaces of the miters one end to the other. So that is 120 lineal feet of glue joint. And normally I would just put a heavy bead on one side and squish it together. But um, with this, that extra glue will just run off in the time it takes me to do the rest of the joint. So I am just going to attempt to uh, do this process with a, a glue brush and the glue, get a good coat smeared on each of those. Hopefully it doesn't all run off and I can flip this thing over and get it done. So uh, I don't know if the camera might die halfway through this, but I can't stop to uh, do anything about it once that process happens. So uh, wish me luck again. This is the third time, right? And uh, we'll see what we get on video of this 30 foot beam glue up. I want to make sure the long points of these miters are glued. I'm going to get my rhythm down here for this part. And incidentally, I looked around town today for one of those uh, rolling glue bottle dispenser things. Nobody had one. I've never needed one before. So I wasn't prepared, but I got to thinking about this part of the job and I thought, boy, this might go a lot better if I had one of those. But you got to fight the battle with the army you have, not the army you wish you had. So I'm just going to do this up here and see where I get. This is fresh type on glue. I want it to be uh, thin so that it spreads easily, but unfortunately that thinness means it's also runny. So I'm working against those two factors here the whole time as I go off camera. Incidentally, I've got the, the furnace shut off in the shop. I don't want any hot warm air blowing on this glues. To, I don't want it to skin over in the process. So that's working all right. It's about you know, a little, little less than 70 degrees in the shop. So it gives me more open time on this glue. But it's mostly about the time, the running time of the glue, how long it has to run. I'm more concerned about it running off the surface than I am having it skin over because of that. And here I am back in the camera on the home stretch. About 12 feet to go out of that 120. So far, I'm not regretting this, but we'll see. All this glue on the outside of the beam is no big deal because I've got a bunch of heavy, heavy texturing and weathering to do on that. So that all gets brushed away. And I pretty much resigned myself to the fact that I'm going to have a fair amount of cleanup of glue to do on the shop floor and the benches here. But assuming I can pull this off, that's a small price to pay. Start off with a full bottle of glue that just pretty much ran out. Must be some thick stuff at the bottom of that bottle. Quit running out at the end there, but have more glue for exactly this time. When this sort of thing happens, don't want to be looking for glue. So I think I'll go back and kind of touch everything up, make sure everything is still to my satisfaction, which it is. Add a little glue here and there. Now that it's had time to kind of sit there and soak in and think about it a little bit, just want to make sure that that's all coated. It is. 
glue is still tacky. Plenty of life left in it. I'm just kind of getting this top edge a little bit here. Once I flip the beam over, any glue that's run down will run back into the joint. So that's not a bad thing. And that is as good as it's going to get. So here goes. Last messy step. Got to make sure the ends of the beam are lined up because I'm not going to be able to slide it once it tips. But there it is. So I switched the angle of the camera there just so you can kind of see this process. Just doing a little bit of wiggling here. Get those miters to kind of squeeze in next to each other there. That looks pretty darn good. The beam is arrow straight going this way. And that'll only get better as I screw this bottom in. So I'll get my extension here and get some screws going. I'll start in the middle again, work my way towards the ends. Just like I did before, I'm, I'm lining up the bottom panel as I tighten the screws. Something like that. At some point, you'll probably be able to see in the camera the squeeze out I'm getting on that joint, which is a marvelous thing. It feels nice and even. I'm just going to skip a few blocks here, kind of get an overall tightening and alignment. Make sure everything is good. You can't see it in the camera, but that really does shift it back and forth to get things lined up. And just like I showed you in the drive fit down at the bottom of that block, <clears throat> just a little bit of space under there because I don't want the blocks to be tight to the bottom before the glue joints are tight. And that is exactly what I'm getting. I'm having a little bit of trouble right here getting the bottom of the beam to center up. It's barely a sixteenth of an inch different. But it's a case where I'm aiming for perfection and I'll settle for the best I can do. Well, I'm pleased with that. I've got uh, the guide screws in all the way along very straight. Everything's nice. I don't think that bottom centering issue will be a deal down there. So I'm just going to go back and fill in all these screws and uh, get that bottom all drawn up tight. And then maybe then breathe a sigh of relief. In this panning shot inside the beam, you can see there's good glue squeeze out all along the inside of those corner miters. So I know the joint will be strong. And if there's any open spots in the glue joint on the outside corners of the beam, when I flip it over, I can always inject a little bit of glue in there from the outside to fill up gaps if there are any. But it's reassuring to see all the glue squeeze out on the inside because it makes me confident that I've got a good strong joint that'll be necessary for transporting and installing this crazy long beam. Well, I'll admit that that was a bit of a hectic glue up session, but I'm very pleased with the way it came out. Got good glue, uh, glue squeeze out on the joint all the way along, inside and out, near as I can tell. And you can see a few clamps down here. And I had a little bit of an issue with getting that bottom panel to center up down there. And part of it um, was caused because uh, the pocket hole screws blew out the bottom on a couple of those, uh, the modified blocks so I didn't get the up pressure I needed. So I just added a few clamps on there just to make sure that that got good and snug as it dries. But uh, all things considered, if it wasn't for that, um, that's 120 lineal feet of glue joint on a beam. Well, I guess it's 60 lineal feet, two sides, but 60 lineal feet of glue joints. And if it wasn't for that, it would be zero clamps, just those pocket screws. So I'm um, really pleased with the way the system works out or worked out on this project so far, but I get to let this dry overnight and uh, go download some video and uh, see where I end up at on this project tomorrow. Well, here I am, another day and another t-shirt, and this beam has had time to dry overnight so I can remove the clamps from this one little section for the bottom there and show you how a 30-foot beam looks 
when it's all glued up and assembled. And I think you'll be kind of impressed when you see how those 30 foot long floppy pieces of one by turn into this faux beam. As you've seen, it's kind of tricky to work on a 30 foot beam and shoot video in a small shop. But one thing that I don't have here is smoke and mirrors. So I'll just hike down to the far end of the beam here with the camera clear at that end of the shop and show you what this looks like. Now I had to crack this beam loose in a couple spots. A couple little dabs of glue got on those blocks underneath there. But for the most part, that's me with a 30 foot faux beam made with the dado and glue block process that you saw demonstrated here. This is the wrong position. I can't pick this thing up in the middle from here. I could do it more like a squat, but it's, uh, it's very rigid over the 30 foot length. It does have the ability to twist a little bit, which I think will only help uh, when it comes time to install this in the great room of a beautiful new home. I'm going to slide this over here and flop it on its side so you can see what that looks like. Which is something like that. And it gives you a look at the bottom of the beam for the first time where everything's all glued in. And it gives you an idea of what's possible in making a big faux beam like this. If this was a solid timber, this whole scope of the project would be different. It would have to be installed as the house was being built because it would take a forklift to lift it. But as it is, I'm able to retrofit this beam into the house that's already in its finished stages and the people are living in there. So it's kind of a remarkable thing in my humble opinion. Now uh, they make foam faux beams uh, this size and this length, which are wonderful. They would be a whole lot easier to maneuver and lift. But the downside there is you don't get the real wood texture. You don't get the fact that it's real wood and you're able to choose only from the selection of colors and textures that they're able to make. This is completely custom from ground zero uh, for the wood species, the stain color, uh, the texture style, uh, and the size and proportion of the beam. So there's a lot of benefits to doing it this way if the foam faux beam option isn't a good one for the project you're looking at. But let me give you a panning shot of the beam at this stage just so you can see what it's like. This end of the beam goes to the back of the house. It's actually quite visible in the great room. Here's the first face splice on this side. And as you'll see, I staggered those splices. They're about five feet apart. Here's the first splice on the bottom. And I've matched up the, the grain. Once this is textured, that, that transition will be quite nice. I've got to do work on this peckiness in the side of the beam as I did in the other video. So you can see what this looks like as it gets textured out and blend that those pecky features together. Here's a little bit of pecky detail on the bottom of the beam. Another splice. This is I think this is the one I featured earlier in the video. The grain just flows really nicely other than the color there. It's a little different. This will just completely go away once it's textured and stained. And I've got another face splice way down here at this end to glue this five foot piece on here. And I'll dip the camera down so you can see the straightness of the beam. I think you can get an idea of what it looks like there. And I guess this is my version of the big reveal once the beam is all glued up. I can't say move that bus or something crazy like that, but I can say roll that beam. So you can see what this looks like on the other side. If I can get it shifted around here. I got to make sure to keep it centered on this work surface so the whole thing doesn't flip over. That would be a dangerous disaster at this point. But that's what uh, the other side looks like here. And I've got to get to work doing all the texturing steps that you see in that other video, starting with using the uh, graph carving disc and an angle grinder to knock the corners down, then a restorer tool, etc. But as far as the beam goes, the design and features of this faux beam building process, that's pretty much what you see is what you get. And I hope you'll leave questions in the comments if there's things about this build that didn't make sense that I missed or that you don't understand.
And I guess I won't know till the job's all done what the linear foot cost of beams like this is. And I'm pretty sure it's more than the foam faux beams. But like I said just a little bit ago, you can get a lot more for your money doing it this way if it's an important thing. And all that is to say uh, faux beams like this made of pecky cypress aren't an inexpensive option, but I really do think that it's a high value option. So I'm going to get to work with all my texturing tools to finish this up and hopefully get it delivered in the next couple of days. But I'll wrap this up by saying, as always, until next time, thanks for watching. Well, hey, I got to say, it's always fun when I notice that at least a couple people are sticking around to the end of the end of the end just to see what's going on in the shop here. But despite your persistence, this really isn't the end of the end of the end yet. But I thought you might get a kick out of seeing what a mess this process generates. I've just finished up the texturing on all 30 feet of all three sides of this beam. And I thought you just might get a kick out of seeing what the shop looks like at this stage of the game because it is a mess. Whew. There's quite a layer of dust on the floor on pretty much everything around here because that restorer tool really tears out the soft grain, especially on this pecky cypress, which is exactly what I want because it gives an awesome weathered texture to the beam. And if you check out the other video I linked earlier, I go a lot more off into the weeds on what it takes to texture and weather a beam like this. But now that I've showed you what this shop looks like when it's at its messiest, I'm going to get everything cleaned up and apply a few coats of stain. And I'll fire up the camera again at the end of the end of the end of the end of the end and uh, show you what this beam looks like when it's ready for delivery and installation. So then until the end of the end of the end of the end of the end, then I'll be back. And what do you think of that as the world's quietest dust collector, huh? Can hardly even hear it at work. And then now I'm ready to bring out the stain the machine. If anyone wants to accuse me of an inability to wrap up a video, I guess I'm guilty as charged, but I wanted to stop at this stage. I've got the shop pretty well cleaned up. I'm about ready to put a coat of classic gray Minwax stain on this beam, but I wanted to show you the miters on the bottom of the beam before I put that heavy gray stain on there, just in case there's any doubters hanging around here at this late stage of the video who would want to accuse me of using caulk or putty to fill those miters in to hide them. If they doubt the capability, of pocket screws and tight bond three glue for gluing up a 30 foot beam. So let me give you a close up and see if you can spot the miter. This end of the beam is definitely one of the best sections on it, but I'm standing right here and I know there's a miter there and I'm pretty sure it's right there. But I think you'll admit that is pretty well hidden. And the giveaway is the direction of the grain, not any kind of a gap on that miter. Here's one of the seams in the face after it's done texturing. And yes, you can see this gray glue line, but that'll go away with the stain. And there are other places on the beam, like right here, where the grain direction is a pretty obvious giveaway on a close up like this. But when this beam is 12 feet off the ground, off the floor, that's going to be pretty convincing that it's a solid beam. Here's another section. There's a miter running right through there, guys. There's a splice. And in all fairness, I'll take you down here to the end of the beam where this is probably one of the more obvious sections right here because the wood grain and the color is different. Here the miter has got a big pecky hole in it. Right here you can see the miter pretty clearly at this stage because of the color of the wood and because of the texture of the grain. But none of that is because there's a gap on that miter. And these are all sections that were essentially clamped with pocket hole screws and nothing more. So I hope you'll agree that this method of using those clamping blocks and this sequence for prepping 
assembling, gluing up, and finishing this beam yields a pretty convincing result for producing a 30-foot faux beam out of real wood. Well, I don't know if this is the moment you've been waiting for, but I can tell you it's definitely the moment I've been waiting for because this 30-foot long extreme faux beam is now 100% complete and ready for delivery. This job's been hanging over my head long enough as it is, and now it's literally hanging over my head because I wasn't able to schedule delivery for this 30-foot long piece until tomorrow. But it gives me an opportunity to show you a couple things about this finished beam. And the first one is how strong it is because it's suspended all 30 feet of it in the shop from two points. I've got one strap here hooked to a sky hook to hold this end of the beam. And then there's only one other strap clear down at this end of the beam. And there's a good 18 feet in between those straps and it's held up there just fine, suspended from the two sky hooks in the next level carpentry shop ceiling. And not only is the beam strong enough to be suspended by two points, it's really not that heavy. As you can see there, I can lift it all by myself because of the relatively thin boards that make it up and the lightweight blocks that hold it all together. And I think it's great you stuck around long enough to see that performance of this beam. So let me give you a quick close up of what the finish looks like now that it's all textured and I've applied the four step stain process to give it this aged weathered look. It's difficult to get a good camera angle and adequate lighting to do justice to the finish of this beam as it's hanging here in the shop. But I'll tell you that I'm quite pleased with the way the texture and the grain flow from one end of the beam to the other, where tight glue joints, deep weathering, and creative texturing provide a pretty convincing look that this is a solid beam and not a faux beam made of 11 separate pieces of wood. Well, I hope you found it worth your while to stick around to the end of 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 this long Next Level Carpentry video to get one last look at this extreme faux beam before it gets shipped out and delivered tomorrow. And I look forward to catching up with all you diehards at the end of the next the next level carpentry video. Take care.